Welcome everyone uh, to our last session of our 2022 Teen Summit. Thank you for hanging out with us all day and hope that you've gotten some useful information. Um, I'm so excited. Everyone in the chat is very excited to see April and I am very excited to introduce April um, for our final session of the day. Um, if you don't know April, April Maza is a nonprofit organizer and independent consultant in the Boston area. She's worked in a variety of library settings for over 20 years, including most recently as a consultant at the Massachusetts Library System. Thank you so much for being back with us, April. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. And um, to all the New England Teen Summit hosts, thanks for all the nice um, <laughs> messages in the chat. Now I'm all like, oh, I better do well. Um, pressure's on. <laughs> um, I am really happy to be here. I'm happy to be a part of the Teen Summit again. Um, and I do want to thank uh, everyone for being here. I know it's one of the last sessions, at least in New England. It's a really nice sunny day, a little chilly, but nice out. Um, you could be out there instead. So <laughs> thanks for being here. Uh, let's see. I am going to bring up my really fancy slides here, if I can. <clears throat> let's see. Sorry, I'm an idiot. Already I'm failing at this uh, assignment. Let me try again. Um, so this is, um, let's see. This is, hopefully you can see slides. Okay. <clears throat> it is just a plain old PDF. So uh, I did not go with anything fancy. Um, let's see. Okay. So I'm actually, I turned my, I just turned my camera off. But I am going to try to keep track of the chat. So I get that going. Um, I also encourage you, you know, if you want to take a break from cameras, feel free. Um, and, uh, you know, do whatever you need to do to feel comfortable. And along those lines, um, I have some ground rules for discussion. And, um, Basically, this comes from Berkeley, and uh, you can, I have the link there, you can borrow this. Uh, we're mostly going to be chatting in the, uh, talking in the chat, um, which might feel a little different for something like this, but I still think it's worth having some ground rules. And uh, as a librarian, of course, I love my acronyms. <laughs> this is called ROPES. And uh, what's great about this is you can use it too. So if you do any kind of like discussion with your teams or with other staff, this is really easy to use. Um, normally, I would also have people, uh, you know, solicit their own ideas uh, as well. But since we don't have a ton of time, I decided to just go with something simple. Uh, so just to cover, R is for respect. Uh, hopefully that's self-explanatory. Um, O is for openness, so meaning a willingness to share, but also a willingness to listen. Pass or participate as a little bit of a choice for you. So if you're like me and you usually like to talk and you like to, um, you know, chime in, uh, you know, maybe you can take a, a step back and give other people time to do that. If you're usually one to pass, um, maybe it takes you time to process things or you feel a little shy. Um, maybe today's the day that you'll uh, participate a little more. And it is different again in the chat as opposed to speaking can feel different. Um, e is for educate and empathize. So we're all at different um, places, either in our experiences or in our careers. And we just want to be mindful of that. And then safety and sensitivity, meaning we want to make each other feel safe here, that you can ask any question, share any story um, without feeling judged or that it's not confidential and just being sensitive to that. Um, also, I just wanted to uh, note on the side there to be present. So I've turned off my notifications. I put my phone <laughs> over there. That helps me. That may help you uh, sort of minimizing those distractions. And as I mentioned, like if that means turning off cameras, um, you know, feel free to do that. Taking care of yourself is really important too. So is the end of a day. I know a lot of you've had a long day. 
grab the beverages you need. This is being recorded. If you need to take breaks, um, feel free to do that. And we're gonna have our first uh, chat practice now. And what I'd like you to do is uh, we're gonna introduce ourselves. So please share your name and your pronouns, especially if that's not part of your screen name. And then if you could take any subject from high school again, what would it be? And optionally, why? And so just you'll put that in the chat and I'll go first to warm us up a little. Um, again, my name is April Maza and my pronouns are she and hers. And I would take French again. Well, actually what I would like is to have just kept learning French and become proficient in French. Uh, that's the language I took in high school and I just wish, I wish I knew another language. I wish I was proficient. Um, some might say French might not be that useful, but <laughs> I still wish I knew. That's the one I took, so I wish I knew. Um, so let's see, anyone else like pick a language or, let's see, oh, calculus, interesting. Oh, art history. Yeah, I have to say I took that in college and I fell asleep so many times, not because I didn't like it, but because they would dim the lights. <laughs> and oh, these are great. Very interesting. And some people might need to think about it, which is fine. Oh, journal. That's interesting. One of my favorite classes in high school was TV. Um, like our high school had a TV studio and I wish I had kept up with that but of course now that would be so different it'd be like a completely different thing so thank you these are great oh Brockton Nicole uh you know maybe because I'm from Brockton uh some people know that some people don't so <laughs> I don't know if you knew that Nicole um shout out to Brockton that's the high school I went to and I'll say when I've done this in person um some people have a strong reaction to this uh feeling like like they would never go back to high school right like you couldn't pay them enough you couldn't give them enough proficiency in french um and that's not really what i'm asking you know i'm definitely not wanting anyone to feel um uncomfortable but i think it's worth uh, acknowledging that right for some people high school was like an awesome time they would go back in a heartbeat um, take all the classes, do all the things that were fun for them. And for a lot of people, yeah, you really couldn't, you couldn't force them, you couldn't pay them enough. Um, and I think it is important to sit with that because you're going to be encountering teens that are going through that time right now where they just want out. They do not want to <laughs> be doing this, this teenage thing, the high school thing. Um, you know, I fall somewhere in the middle and maybe most people do, but I, I do think it is just pointing out. It was interesting, again, like when we did it in person, how it, it brought up some feelings. So, um, just a bit of reflecting there. And thank you again for sharing in the chat. Feel free, if you are still thinking, feel free to chime in. Uh, so I did want to just mention a little bit about myself. Um, you know, why am I even here? <laughs> Why am I talking about this? Uh, but we won't take up too much time because I'm I'm keeping my eye on the clock. Uh, I'm not a teen librarian. I have worked with teens in the past. My role has been more of like a facilitator, giving people uh, time and space to problem solve. Informing is one of the things I hope to do today. And so I really will be relying on you all um, to share and to and help each other out and i loved i saw that there's like a discord discussion and i think that's so great like the people here today can keep going i've always craved that especially at conferences and the virtual ones like you know you get back to work and you're kind of like oh back to the grind um so this is going to be such a great opportunity for you all um i'm also not a spy i kind of <laughs> was goofing around with the theme Mission Impossible for a little bit. I don't know if you noticed, um, but you know, I I try not to stick too close to a theme, so it's probably like gone after <laughs> this slide. Um, but if you get nothing else out of this, I have included a link to the Spy Museum in DC. Has some really cool activities that you can do with like kids and teens. So I just want to leave you with like one little nugget. If uh, you know, if all else fails, <laughs> you have that. But um, hopefully, I'll do my job. 
do my role well and you will uh, get something out of this. So uh, this is the agenda. We're going to do a little exploring next, just thinking about what we know already, what we want to know, and then some adolescent development and why it matters. So that's the part where I'll be um, informing you. Maybe you know a lot of that too, which would be great. And then going over some strategies. And then question time. Um, I decided to put questions before the actual end of the session because what I wanna do at the end is have us reflect and plan. And those questions and what comes up with the questions um, hopefully answers, but that discussion might inform our reflection. Uh, so hopefully I'll keep us all on track and we'll get to that uh, before 4.30. All right, so now we're gonna have a little fun with reaction buttons. Um, and that should be at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on reactions, not the arrow, but if you click on reactions, you should get a little menu of emojis. And I would like to know from you all, if you have any personal experience with teens, um, give a thumbs up. So this could be you're a parent or caregiver of teens. Um, maybe you have friends who, um, you know, good friends with teens or you're, neighbors you have some personal connection could be other relatives so i have to just kind of scroll through the people to see so a few people a few people who are uh, wanting to uh answer that one i'm just checking the chat too so all right a few people how about if you currently work with or have worked with teens, and it could be at your library, it could be somewhere else, it could be as a volunteer, it could be at a, like a whole different job, click the clap emoji because you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> and again, this could be in the past, doesn't have to be in the library. So a few people, not everyone, or if, you, if you're not choosing the answer, but I do see a bunch of um, claps. Uh, all right. Next one is if you've ever dealt with a difficult patron, and it does not have to be successfully, <laughs> but if you've ever encountered a difficult patron, um, click on the surprise emoji. So that's the face with the O mouth. And I'm going to guess like most people here, again, unfortunately. Um, all right. Anyone who hasn't, that's pretty good. It probably will happen to you someday. So I'm sorry to say. Okay, and then the final one is um, if you were ever a teen, but you are no longer a teenager, click on the heart emoji. And I do expect that everyone will have this one. And then that way I'll know who decided to check out for the afternoon. <laughs> I'm kidding. I told you you could take breaks. But I do want to see, yeah, a lot of hearts. All right, cool. I was just scrolling through that. So all this to say, you already have a lot of experience. You've been through this yourself. Uh, you, some of you may be currently, you know, observing uh, what's going on with teens. You have experience. You've dealt with difficult situations. You've dealt with uh, negative behavior. So I would like to know in the chat, and I'm going to try to use this later, I will try to keep up with the chat. Um, what's missing? Like, what do you want to know? Basically, not a scenario, but what drew you here today? So what are you like, hoping to get out of this um, to see? And you can put that in the chat. Um, you can think on it, too. So. We can keep going, but anything that you know you've really been wanting to ask uh, someone or talk about, you can put in there. All right, so I see some things coming in, and this is good. Okay. All right, good. I will. I will check back in on that to thank you for um, sharing and of course things will come up and that's why we have questions towards the end so
So um, I wanted to talk about adolescent development and why it's important to understand. And I actually started to make an analogy with my cat because I have a cat that has some sort of unusual <laughs> behavior. Um, and thinking about that, like, it's really important to know that this is just normal, right? The way, you know, the way pets act, we are not always gonna be able to understand, um, but it's because they're pets and it's normal. So understanding adolescent development helps us sort of take a step back and say, this is why the teen is behaving this way. They're working on X skill. And that might be social skills. That's actually a thing that they're working on, even though it might seem like they're almost grown. Um, so this norm, this behavior is normal and it's to be expected. I also think it's really important to keep in mind that development is not a linear path. And we often learn this with child development, right? We learn about regression, um, but this happens with teens too. And no two people have that same path or develop in the same way. And also different factors influence development, right? And so you'll also see like communities will be very different because we've got um, influences like culture and parents and other relationships and environment, status, um, even just temperament, right? We all are born with our own personalities. So development can be really confusing, not just to us, but <laughs> to the people going through it, the teens, um, and messy, but it's also really exciting and, and really remarkable. It's kind of amazing that it continues so far into our lives. Um, and many of you may know about this, some of these changes, but the research is actually pretty recent. And studies have shown that the brain undergoes um, a massive reorganization between the ages 12 and 25. And it has to do with not so much um, new neural pathways and things growing, but actually things being weeded away. And these reorganizations cause genes to behave in a way that is unpredictable or can be confusing to adults. I have a little story time for you. <laughs> so when my eldest niece was in their teens, they are in their mid-20s now, I happened to be at the house when they received a package, something I bought online, and it was part of a bathing suit. It happened to be just the bottoms. And I said, what's the top look like? And the reaction was, I don't know, why don't you leave me alone? You know, I can't remember, <laughs> just a total freak out. I can't remember everything else. Run into their room, slam the door. And the rest of us were just so taken aback. I mean, thankfully, like I had other family around to reassure me that I had not done anything wrong, had not had like a tone to my voice. Um, and we kind of were giggling about it, but I really was mystified. And then of course we were like, what it what does the top look like like why are they acting like this um so uh not long after you know i was working in a public library at the time worked with teens and i read the article it's from yalsa and i linked to it in our resources um you can read it without a membership which is awesome it's called how understanding teen brain development can help improve ya reference services the little mouthful uh by allison evans and they talk about these changes in the brain that influence behavior and this sort of stereotype of the emotional teen, right? The angsty teen. Uh, but these studies show that there's a scientific reason for this behavior. Teenagers' brains evaluate emotional reactions out of a different location in the brain than adults. So that to me alone is just fascinating, um, but it's what could account for this sort of miscommunication. So at San Diego State University, volunteers were asked to look at images of people's faces and identify their emotional state. The study determined that teens ages 11 to 18 had difficulty identifying the emotions. The ability to identify emotions in other humans utilizes the brain's prefrontal cortex. So adults use the prefrontal cortex more. It's more developed in them. Um, Believe it or not, <laughs> if you're an adult, you might be thinking, is it? Uh, <laughs> but that's where higher level thinking comes from. It governs reason and planning. 
So for teens, they rely more on the amygdala, which is a small almond-shaped part of the brain, and that guides instinctual or gut reactions. So this is the high-stress, fight-or-flight area of the brain. And so just imagine if your brain was always in that mode. And I actually think some of us can from the last few years, right? It's been a very stressful time. Um, and it's exhausting. It, well, it seems exhausting to me. So that's why I have a, we have our exhausted little brain here. So teenagers, that sort of over-the-top behavior um, is frequently a result of information in the amygdala part of the brain. And the response is being processed by the underdeveloped part of the brain. And the result is that teens feel insecure and they judge neutral or vague behavior as negative or threatening. So when I asked about the bathing suit, I thought my tone you know, was neutral, but it might've seemed like I was being judgmental. Like, oh, what does it look like? And that's not how I said it, <laughs> I can reassure you. But if you think about you know, in your library and your teen services, the difference between saying, can I help you? And let me know if you need any help, right? We can all imagine, again, you might say it neutral, can I help you? Might be heard as like, can I help you? You know, sort of insinuating you're doing something wrong. And how many times have we heard that too? You talk to a teen, it's like, I wasn't doing anything. And you're like, I didn't think you were doing anything, but now I do because you said that. Um, that's, that's what's going on here with the, uh, with the fabulous amygdala sort of confusing things. So I see a lot in the chat. I just wanted to check if there were any questions before moving on. No, but people still coming up with sort of what they want to know, which is awesome. So in the book, uh, Brainstorm, The Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain, the author talks about four developmental needs influenced by the amygdala. And he calls it essence. So that's emotional support, social engagement, novelty seeking, and creative exploration. And a lot of you might know about the 40 developmental needs of teens. That's from the Search Institute. I got that right. Yes, <laughs> it's been around for a long time. I did put that handout in our tote bag, um, and their website has other great resources. But I like this because it's just four things. <laughs> it's got an acronym. It's easy to remember. Um, but also, you can relate all of these to library services. And then you can also think about how um, they relate to behavior. So for instance, if a teen is bored, you can maybe provide creative exploration. OK. Uh, so overlaying these needs is another influence on behavior, a skewed risk versus reward motivation system. So teens are incredibly reward driven and they do understand consequences of their actions, but they might believe that the reward outweighs the risk. So the rational brain, remember that prefrontal cortex, that's the one that's underdeveloped, it's a little behind. So they know the pros and cons, but that the limbic system sort of overrides this. So in this picture, as an adult, I'm thinking, ah, oh, that looks dangerous. <laughs> but for a teen, this looks exciting. This looks thrilling. They're thinking about, you know, how great this is going to feel, how the water is going to feel. And also their friends are going to reward this. Their friends are going to think they are so cool if they do this. So we have to remember that risk taking is normal and should be expected. Um, and what we can do is try to think of positive risks of what we can uh, offer to teens, right? We're, and when we refer back to essence or other, you know, we could look at the 40 developmental needs as well. So for instance, <clears throat> maybe you've got a teen that would be good for a leadership role. And maybe you don't have that in your life, you know, maybe you don't have a teen advisory board or something to offer them for, for that kind of thing. But maybe you could help them explore what else is out there and what's out in their community. And this would also address this, the developmental need of social engagement. So we're kind of able to tackle behavior and development um, and the sort of risk versus reward at the same time. So the good news is that development is really exciting. Teens like challenges, they like 
doing creative things, they're curious, they like learning new skills. And understanding behavior, I'm sorry, excuse me, <coughs> just gonna cough in all your ears. Um, understanding adolescent development helps us discern, determine when behavior is something that's annoying but normal or if it's dangerous and then how best to deal with the situation. So here's our little amygdala just rolling on into the library on a skateboard. I'm sorry, I should not have said him because any um, teen could do this. And I've actually heard of this, just taking the skateboard right into the hallway. Um, so negative behaviors typically fall into one of two categories, distracting or dangerous. Distracting are the behaviors that are disruptive, annoying, irritating, maybe even rude, unfortunately. But let's all remember too that teens don't have many opportunities to engage in public spaces. They never have. I guess I remember that as a teen, we really had nowhere to go, especially places that don't cost money. Um, and since they lack that experience, and then let's overlay COVID on that, right? Because a lot of the teens that we're seeing have spent a number of years sort of socially isolated uh, and, and so many other ramifications of that as well, right? But they're not always aware of how their behavior affects others. And it's best to always assume that a teen does not have malicious intent when they engage in distracting behavior. And again, I would say rude is different. They do know, <laughs> they do know right and wrong. They know pros and cons. Um, so that's a little different, but for the most part, you know, they might just be testing limits. They're trying to get your attention, even though it might be in a negative way or the attention from their friends. And then dangerous situations are those where serious harm may be done to the team themselves, um, other people, or library property. And we will get to that later. I'm gonna take one more sip of water here, excuse me. So we want to have our overarching goal be to avoid problems before they occur. Um, and of course, yeah, easier <laughs> said than done. But if we kind of can approach it with that in mind, and this would be, you know, a whole library approach to resolve issues without escalating. And instead of throwing teams out for infractions, really trying to take the opportunity to help them understand what the expected norms are. And part of how we can do that is to build rapport. And again, I know easier said than done. This does take time and effort. We don't always see teens on a regular basis, and I know that. But if you can do things like um, asking their names when they come in, introducing yourself, introducing other staff uh, can help with that. And with some teens, you know, once they get to know you, uh, they might listen a little more because they understand that you are in charge of that space, that you have taken the time to get to know them, and you're going to advocate for them. But make it clear that you don't like to manage behavior, you know, be direct with them. Um, and you don't want to kick them out, but you know, you will if they can't follow the rules. And we'll talk about more that more too. What are the rules? Um, and I'm sure you've heard this a million times, but keeping them busy. And I would love to hear ideas in the chat if you've had some success with this. Um, it does not have to be a formal program, right? We're not going to always have the capacity to do that all the time, even though those are great. But just even having things available for them to do, like board games and card games, puzzles, um, coloring pages if they like that and even volunteer activities and yeah that can take some time from you too and does you do to be able to give up a little control with that but it's definitely something that you can use yeah. there is some some ideas in the chat oh 
excuse me, I just all of a sudden got in the sniffles. Um, of course, these are some great ideas. Um, oh, I love that chess. That's something I still have not really learned. We'll throw that in with French. <laughs> so there are great ideas in the chat. Um, you could even do something like a cool down kit or an anti boredom kit, right? So having a box or a basket, you know, something that's kind of special for when things get out of control. Um, they might not act like they're into these activities at first. I know that's happened with me before. Um, and then once they get into it, they're into it. But you can have like fidget toys, um, notebooks, noise canceling headphones. Um, or, you know, other headphones that they can borrow. And I do love, um, I am saving the chat, so I hope you all are too, because there's some really good, good ideas of it in there. Shrink things, love that. <laughs> and we know being proactive isn't always going to stop challenging behavior, right? We can do all of these things and things are going to come up. So there should be rules. But there should not be separate rules for teens. Uh, you're basically asking them to follow the same rules as, every, as everyone else. So your library's code of conduct or a patron behavior policy, or if you're at a school, um, whatever the school behavior policy is. And if you don't have one, that's a whole other thing that needs to be addressed. I'd be very surprised if your library doesn't. Uh, and that the consequences for an infraction, again, are the same for all people. It doesn't matter uh, what the age is. So teens will, and I think any age will notice if things are different, if it's like a certain time of day, um, you know, if these rules only apply after school or um, certain areas, certain people or certain staff members, right? Um, and it is important to have that consistency and that all staff enforce these rules, that it doesn't fall just on you. And I know that in this group, we've got a lot of teen librarians and maybe you are part-time uh, teen in reference or another department. And you are feeling like a lot falls on you. Um, that's kind of a whole other workshop that I can do, but <laughs> we'll save the plug for later. But since I accepted most people here are the teen librarian, we're not gonna talk about why you should be nice to teens. It's kind of a whole other thing, but definitely the, you know, to get everyone on board for um, enforcing the rules fairly uh, is important. It, it will go a long way in, with behavior issues. Sort of along those lines, it's really impossible to have a rule for every situation. And there's always going to be something new and surprising. Um, and that's why there is no one size sort of answer, no magic answer to any of this, unfortunately. Um, and it's impossible to have even signs that are going to address all these issues. And in fact, I would say, you know, if you have a lot of signs, especially about behavior in your library, in your teen space, to really re-evaluate that and maybe take down some things and kind of start fresh because the presence of a sign doesn't mean an understanding of the rules and a lot of people don't read signs we already we already know that i think <laughs> we've seen that over and over again in our libraries um and really the bottom line is that signs are not a substitute for staff um so uh, you know a team that is going through all these developmental changes not really able to um you know have reasoned thinking where they weigh these pros and cons and decide not to do whatever the disruptive behavior isn't going to look at a sign and go, oh, that sign says I shouldn't be loud. <laughs> so I'm not going to be loud. Um, <clears throat> if you do need a specific sign for your teen area, um, I would say to keep it simple and minimal. And uh, this is not my own idea. This comes from, um, I believe, one of the books that I have in the resources. But you could have something that just says respect. Uh, respect yourself, respect others, respect property. And that really would cover probably a lot of what's in your code of conduct anyway. Um, it's also important to, you know, again, thinking about signs, like you cannot correct behavior from afar. Um, so you, 
you know, are going to need to get up in close. Um, you know, sometimes that means pulling up a chair if you're trying to talk to a group of kids um, and being really direct with them. So you can't do this, name what the behavior is, uh, and here's how it affects other people, and then what the consequence will be if they can't follow the rules. And I'll also mention here too, not to take uh, the person's behavior personally, right? We wanna separate the behavior from the person. Um, disruptive or aggressive behavior usually means something else is going on, some other problem. Although I will caution, because I've seen this a lot lately, we want to avoid labeling um, other people, teens especially, as mentally ill, just because they're being rude or acting up or acting in a way that confuses us because we don't act that way. Um, that's that's not the point of what we're trying to do, <clears throat> right? So what can we do <laughs> when this stuff is going on? Um, one of the first things is to ask them to stop as a favor or ask if there's a way that you could help. So if they are being loud and it's bothering other people, and that's the key, right? If some of you are lucky enough to have team spaces that are closed off, have a door, um, or are in a part of the library where it's not going to bother other people, that's amazing. Because if it's not bothering anyone, maybe it doesn't need to be a rule and maybe it doesn't need to be addressed. But if that's not the case, you can say, hey, can you do me a favor? You're kind of talking loudly and I can see it's bothering other people. Would you mind talking more quietly, please? And hopefully that works. <laughs> um, you could also ask what would be helpful from you. So if you uh, maybe have a more serious problem going on, like a teen is upset, they're acting frustrated, um, you could ask what will help you cool down. And maybe you have something in that kit we talked about that could help them out. Um, maybe they're listening, I can't stand this, listening to like music or a video on their phone and the volume's on and they don't have headphones. <laughs> Maybe you could offer them headphones to borrow. Um, <clears throat> maybe they're bored. You know, they came to the library, they didn't bring any homework or anything to do, and now you can offer them something to do by just seeing if, you know, if you can help with it, whatever the issue is. And if they comply with your request, all you have to do is say thank you, you know, thanks for helping out today. And then that's kind of it, because we don't want to really like dwell on these issues. We don't want to make it into a bigger deal than it already is. That goes back to de-escalating, right? And avoiding, uh, avoiding a problem if we can. And now if they still don't comply, um, then you inform them of the consequences. So you're giving them that second chance um, and you wanna have that ready, right? That should be in your code of conduct as well. Like if there is an uh, infraction of a behavior policy, what happens? And then you would say, I've asked you to speak more quietly. You've chosen not to. If it continues, I'm going to have to ask you to, you know, and whatever the consequences. So um, in some cases it might be they need to leave for the day, but again, we're hoping to not get to that point all the time. Um, that shouldn't be the only consequence <laughs> that you have. <clears throat> so maybe it is like take a break and come back in 15 minutes. Um, if they're using a computer and the issue is with the computer, they're not taking turns or it's gaming console, that kind of thing, um, then they need to take a break, but they can come back in whatever time that you say. And then when you, uh, if they still don't do it and you employ the consequence, you wanna always welcome them back. So if it is to leave, um, welcome them back to come tomorrow um, or you know, if it, they can't play on the, the computer anymore, the gaming system, um, you know, let's try again tomorrow. If they're being asked to leave for longer than the day, then you want to make sure, and that again, I think would be for more like a dangerous situation. Um, you would tell them when they can come back and who they need to talk to, and that might be you or it might be your director. And then we just want to make sure that conversations about welcoming, welcoming them back and not rehashing or lecturing 
Uh, we want to treat each day as a new day. And I know that can be hard, right? Especially if you're dealing with kids who have been rude um, <clears throat> and, and where things do seem like they're personal. Uh, we still want to give them that chance to always come back to the library. And when you give choices and consequences, what we're hoping is that you're not the villain, right? And again, that could be hard for some teens to grasp, but you can explain to them again, like, I don't want to have to do this, but you're making the choice. Um, you're making the decision. So they always have a choice. If you find that you, you're having a lot of behavior issues that are, um, you know, hopefully you're not going it totally alone, but if you're feeling really at a loss, you can track um, the behavior issues to determine a pattern. What we want to avoid is keeping tabs on certain teens and sort of targeting them. <clears throat> um, we, every day, again, like I said, is a new day, but we can keep aware of recurring issues to develop strategies to deal with them. And if you're in a public library, you might want to reach out to the schools and talk to them. Again, not naming uh, specific teens, but asking if they're having these issues um, and how they're dealing with them. I'm just gonna, I noticed some activity in the chat uh, and see what's come up there. Oh, I like that. Teens are more likely to use the headphones. Yeah, they probably are, you know, maintaining their privacy, which I think a lot of adults are not very good at. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so dangerous situations. So there is a difference between an infraction of like the code of conduct, again, being disruptive or annoying, and something that's a safety concern or a violation of law. And the decision on how to deal with dangerous situations and when to the call the police, again, should not be just on you. This is a whole library uh, decision and conversation. This is important for all ages in our library, right? How we deal with this. And we really only wanna call the police if um, a law is broken or in those dangerous situations. And I know that you might be hesitant to call the police at all because you're not sure how they're gonna react. And so I would say that you need to talk to other people at your library and public safety department. Every town and city is different. Uh, in your town, you might have other resources. There might be social workers or um, EMTs or other people that you call for different situations, depending on what the situation is, where you are not afraid to deal with it because you are not sure how the police will re react. And I, I totally get that. Um, but again, it's not just for you to determine. <clears throat> it shouldn't be all on um, one person and it really shouldn't be just a teen issue. As I said, it affects people of all ages. Uh, we also want to avoid calling parents. We want to maintain teens' privacy and their trust in you and their trust in the library. I would say, again, only for like very extreme situations, um, something that's very dangerous or you, you uh, no longer know how to deal with a situation. Um, if the police are involved, they will often be calling the parents and I would say let them do that. Um, and then to remember to protect yourself. So all that being said, you do not want to put yourself in harm's way. I have definitely heard of some stories not to do with teens, actually adults, um, you know, following staff into parking lots, um, being really inappropriate, um, you know, verbally. And so staff isn't sure is that is that dangerous is that harmful and i think you again you really want to protect yourself and um whatever that whatever that takes <clears throat> without overreacting right <laughs> we, um because we've seen what happens when that can happen so i feel like i've been talking a long time that's my spiel um and now is the time for you all to share stories and to ask questions. <clears throat> and I know I did see some in the chat and one of them, I knew it would come up. What do you do when they won't listen to the consequence, right? So if you're telling them, if you don't do this, this is what's gonna happen. 
and they still don't do it. Um, and I will have to say, I have not dealt with that, that I've been lucky um, and my experience has never gotten that far. So I would invite um, people who have dealt with that to share and you can unmute yourself or you can put that in the chat. And anyone, if you have a question that you wanna ask or a story you wanna share, um, you can just unmute yourself. I don't think we're huge, well, we are 80 something people. You could uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you. And actually, why don't I stop sharing for a minute here so I can see all the people better. Anyone want to share or have a question? I do like Ellen's suggestion. Uh, sometimes when they're behaving well, but are just too loud, I say, keep doing what you're doing, but at half the volume. <clears throat> oh, Lauren, I see your hand up. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I might've been one of the comments that you were referring to. Um, but we have a really busy, I'm at uh, Waltham Public Library, and it's a big teen space. It's separated from like the rest of the um, building pretty much. It's ideal, um, but we get a large crowd and we have kind of a two-part problem. One, and it's very small numbers of, of patrons that it's happening with, but um, being on break, meaning they, they, did something that warranted them to be asked to leave for a week or a month. We've had a couple of uh, experiences in the past month um, that have led to that. Having them sneak back into the building, having them refuse to leave and, or like just bicycling around in the parking lot and scooting around on the scooter in the parking lot and doing things that are dangerous for them. Um, and then as a, you know, kind of a sidebar to that problem of just that that group of teens is communicating with the rest of the staff who they are and what they look like and wanting to respect, you know, patron privacy, um, but also keep our staff informed of like this rotating cast of patrons that are out for a week or out for a month or they need to schedule an appointment with the director before they can come back. Um, and uh, I know that happens on the adult side, but it's just not, uh, they don't come into our space because we don't have unattended adults. So it's not really something we need to stay as well informed on. Um, so yeah, refusing to leave and not definitely not wanting to call non-emergency and, and feeling like really kind of trapped in that situation. And Lauren, how, how have people been dealing with it so far? Like, what do you think is not working in that situation? Um, I, I mean, I think our teen room is hurting a little bit because um, like I, I started in August and they had lost their director um, a month before. So I think a little bit of it's just mm -hmm. the growing pains mm -hmm. that of, of like losing someone and not understanding that it, that experience is bigger than them and, and all of that stuff, that adjustment. But um, uh, and having consistent people in the space, which we we do have now and have had for like a month or two. Um, but uh, for the word on the street is that the some teens think it's hilarious that they can do things and not get any consequence and just be let back in shortly after. And so and again, it's like I could count people on one hand, but they. Right. <laughs> are making it a high high stress situation for all the adults that want want them to feel welcome. It's hard to say like you can't come back for a whole month. Please stop coming back to try to come back before that time, but also you're totally welcome once that month is done and you've addressed that behavior. Right. I'm thinking on this. <laughs> um, this one my it's really <laughs> sticky. It's terrible. Yeah. It just it twists my gut and I just yeah. want I want to uh, get it back to where it was, the space that we have. Thank you for sharing that. And if people have ideas to share with Lauren, as I'm sure you know, others would like to know too. And I'm thinking on that. Thank you again, Lauren. Um, maybe 
and I know we can't get into like, like all the nitty gritty of what the behavior is, but maybe even reconsidering like what the consequence is. So if kicking them out means they're just gonna sneak back in, um, is there something else, right, that could be done? And then it's not so alluring to, you know, cause I totally see what you're saying. <laughs> like and that, to them, it's like, what does it matter what I do? Because I'll just get back in. Um, I do wanna let, um, is it Jake um, or Jack? Uh, so I see your hand is up. So, and let's keep thinking for Lauren. Sure, thank you, it's Jack. Um, just as something that I've been seeing is there, there's a trend, I'm teen librarian, um, the teen librarian for the Hopkinton Public Library in Massachusetts. And there is a trend right now um, where folks, teenagers really, and it's this big in my sixth grade group, six, maybe early seventh, but really fizzles out after that, um, to see how disruptive they can get before they're kicked out of public places. And this is not just library, it's the pizza place across the street, it's the skate park, it's everywhere. Um, and I'm just wondering how people um, combat things like that that are kind of like social media trends uh, in their libraries and how we can kind of spin it to be a little bit more positive. That is interesting. I, I almost kind of want to swear, like those little bleeps. Like, what? <laughs> but <clears throat> if we think about what's going on in their brains, right, and their um, development, the risk and the reward system, like, I, I totally get that. Like, it's so annoying. Um, and I do, Lauren's put some context in the chat. It's like kind of a different thing going on. Um, what what this is right the uh we're all trying to like get kicked out of places and this you know we're all hopping on this trend maybe there is a place or a way to like offer that safely right like uh putting a positive spin on the risk um i mean i kind of would go with like school auditorium like i don't know is there a way to set up something like that um, yeah, and Kate mentions they're testing their limits and they, and they get, you know, they're going to get kicked out of everywhere, um, especially places where like, you're not, not a public library, right? It's a pizza place or coffee shop, like, they have no problem kicking them all out. Um, and not even necessarily welcoming them back. Uh, so maybe there's a way to like, kind of like a community effort to like, are you going to get it out of your system? And, otherwise you're not going to be going anywhere um please other ideas in the chat that's definitely a new one for me um and i'm looking at the chat i'm also looking at the time anyone else want to unmute i feel like we're doing a little group therapy uh, just by kind of naming some of this stuff um yeah more rapport I mean, definitely, I think getting to know and some names, right? Like when an adult knows your name, you feel like a little more accountable. Anna, my former coworker says, is there a way to reward good behavior that would actually appeal to them? Like what's valuable, their bikes and scooters? Maybe you can reward them with a way to keep their stuff safe when they come in. I like that, right? Like thinking of, if you can stop doing this, we'll do this. <laughs> um, and can't, someone suggested candy, reward with food, um, or special, some sort of special privileges. Like <clears throat> if you can stop going into every place in town trying to get kicked out, we will let you. And maybe there's a way to like, again, do that in a contained space. Um, but stuff like, uh, Laura mentioned like mooning someone and pepper spraying another uh, so-called friend. It's not really much of a friend that's pepper spraying you. That's pretty horrific. Um, yeah, those are those are bigger issues. And I do feel like maybe in that case you're needing more support from um, not not even just other people in the library because it sounds like a lot of transition there, but other support in the community. Um, and also that's not necessarily um, punitive. Uh, like police departments. So I'm gonna put my screen up again. Um, I, 
I am sorry that we're running out of time. I did want to just share something with you and then, um, you know, if uh, we have a couple more questions or um, situations, we can get to that. And then don't forget that Discord. I love that idea so much because we can all gather there and um, get more ideas. So in the tote bag, there is a handout. Uh, part of this is, is reflection. And I would encourage you to consider reflective practice in your interactions with teens. So uh, what that means, separate from the handout, is just a sort of an idea to keep in mind, is to intentionally deconstruct these interactions. So what, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and why? Why does it work? Why does it not work? And sort of help you move away from um, unproductive things like rumination, which happens to be a hobby of mine, um, anger, blame, you know, sort of the negative stuff that comes up with these, separate it out um, and move towards actively learning from our experiences. Because I know we don't always, we don't even always perform our best. Um, in these situations, right? <clears throat> and so for today, though, on the handout, it's more of a reflection about the session. Um, so what can you use from today to help you out? And then where do you need more support? So if it is something like you don't know what to do in a dangerous situation, you don't know the best place to call, um, then you would incorporate that into your plan. So I always think like a little, even just a mini action plan is really good. Um, and you can use this for the whole day today, if you like, um, go for it. <laughs> I think I think it's a word, uh, Google Doc. So just make a copy and um, so that you have it as your own. But for this, uh, it's what to, what will you do next week, next month, next year? So for that example, um, next week, Set up a meeting with your director or um, it could be the principal. Um, what do we do for the dangerous situations, especially if you haven't had one come up um, and you don't know if you don't know what it is. And then maybe next month you meet with someone from the school to make a connection there. Actually, maybe you want to wait for next year since it's almost the end of the year. So you're kind of keeping that in mind. Um, some of the other things could be to check out the resources from the session, to connect with public safety, find out, you know, are there other resources, um, depending on different situations. Um, maybe it's incorporating reflective practice, uh, trying to do that more often. Reading more about teen brain development, there's great resources there. Reviewing your library's code of conduct, and if you have any suggestions for it. Um, do you know, do you see some issues maybe targeting teens or things that seem um, like inappropriate consequences? That's another thing that you can do. And please also share in the chat if you have ideas of what you want to do next week, next month, next year, sort of to tackle this topic. Um, we definitely want to hear them. And we do have a couple minutes, but I wanted to share the slide to say thank you. Um, and my website if you do want to get in touch. And this is the resources. There's also a handout in the tote bag. Um, so you don't have to, I mean, this is in the tote bag as well, but in case you want to just grab that. So that's it for slides. We'll go back to group setting and see if anyone else wanted to ask a question or share ideas. Oh, thank you for the thank yous. I really thank you. This has been um, really refreshing for me since I've missed a lot of the library people. <laughs> any, any other chat? Well, we can always end a minute early. <laughs> thank you so much, April. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you again for inviting me. And feel free to put your your questions in the in the chat as we wrap up. Um, so also a big thank you to everyone here today who participated. 
Um, thank you to Simon and Schuster who provided in source books for um, providing the ARCs, which are also in the tote bag that you can find. Um, and then I'll put the link in the chat. We do have um, a form for feedback and evaluation. And so that is always helpful when um, we get together to start planning for the following year. So please do go and fill that out when you get a chance. And um, on behalf of all of all of the state consultants, uh, we want to thank you again for being part of it, our day. And um, have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye.